I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Do not be conformed to this world. In this world, rights are trumpeted. So what happens when my rights are trampled upon? Do not be conformed to this world. In this world, people readily take offence. So what happens when I'm offended? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Christian friend, am I conformed or transformed? How does a transformed mind think? How does a transformed life react when somebody violates my rights and deliberately gives offence? But let's push this out further, because this is a word for all Christians in all generations. It's a word that first came to believers in Rome, and in a few years' time, they were being slaughtered in their tens of thousands. How are believers to react? Not just when they're offended, not just when their rights are violated, but when they are actively persecuted, when evil is perpetrated against them, when they're actually put to death. Now, why are there saints' days? I know we don't keep saints' days, but in churches' calendars over the, over the centuries, there have been what are called saints' days. Where do those saints' days come, come from? It was because in the early church, there were so many martyrs, so many heroic deaths for Jesus, that they never wanted to forget these heroes of faith. Now, we've abandoned that because the saints' days have became associated with so much myth and legend and confusion. But we don't forget the heroes of faith. And it's not just then. It's going on today. Believers today live in hostile situations. They're isolated from their families, isolated from their communities. They're denied education, employment. Believers today are harassed, attacked, beaten, tortured, raped, imprisoned, put to death for no other crime than loving and following the Lord Jesus Christ. How are Christians to live in a hostile world? What does it mean in a hostile world to live a transformed life? Well, come with me to Romans chapter 12, and this morning we're looking at verses 14 to 21. How to live to the glory of God in a hostile world. Now, as you read Paul's words, did you pick up the unspoken undercurrent? It's like an invisible thread holding these verses together. But what we do, we're just simply going to open up the verses and then we'll draw the lesson. So please, if you have the sheet, have it in front of you. If you have a Bible, have it in front of you. It'll make much more sense as we go through these things. Let's look at uh, what Paul has to say, verses 14 to 21 of Romans chapter 12. So verse 14, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Christians will be persecuted. Jesus said so, Peter said so, Paul said so. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why are they being persecuted? Because they're seeking to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. So for nothing more than being loving neighbours, good citizens, disciples of Jesus, Christians will be persecuted. You will be persecuted. Now, is that fair? No. As Blandina, a Christian slave girl who was uh, uh, horribly martyred in the second century, she said, I am a Christian. We do nothing to be ashamed of. And so faced with the, with the burning injustice of it all, what might be our instinct? Revenge, to get my own back. But what does it say? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. 
Treat them better than they deserve. And it's more than sort of holding yourself back, self-control in the face of injustice and provocations, because the world can do that. And we're not to be conformed to the world. It says Paul, bless those who persecute you. Seek their highest good. Pray for their never dying souls. Who knows? God may lead them to repentance. Saul of Tarsus, like a wild animal, isn't he? He's breathing threats and murder on his way to Damascus to arrest more Christians and imprison them, have them put to death. But somebody must have blessed him, somebody must have been praying for him. Because the greatest persecutor of the church becomes the greatest preacher of Christ. Graham Staines was an Australian missionary. Over over 30 years he worked uh, with the poor and particularly uh, lepers in Orissa in India. He spoke their language. He was popular with his patients. Uh, He helped recovering lepers uh, find work, make a living. And with an open Bible he told them, about Jesus, and people were saved. In 1999, he was visiting an area. It was a cold night, and so Graham and his two sons, Philip, aged 10, and Timothy, aged 6, they spent the night in their car in a station wagon. That night, uh, they were attacked by a militant Hindu mob, and the car was set on fire and they were burned to death. The three charred bodies that were recovered were found clinging to each other. He gave 34 years of his life to serving these people in Jesus' name. Now, what was his widow's response to the death of her husband and her sons? It was in all the Indian newspapers. This is what she said. She said, I have only one message for the people of India. I'm not bitter, neither am I angry. But I have one great desire, that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, who gave his life for their sins. Let us burn hatred and spread the flame of Christ's love. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Look at verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Now, as Paul now sort of jumped rails, is he moving on to a different subject? Is he talking now about relationships within the church? How we relate to each other? We rejoice with each other, we weep with each other. Well, yes, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. Paul says, if one member suffers, he's talking about the body of the church, the body of Christ, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honoured, all rejoice together. So yes, he, it is applied to the church. But no, because he's continuing the thought of verse 14. Because what does revenge look like? It's getting my own back. It's hurting them as they hurt me. So I weep when they rejoice, and I rejoice when they weep. Yes, because they're getting what they deserve, revenge. Notice, Paul, that's what the world does. And you're not to be conformed, you're to be transformed. So when good things happen to bad people, rejoice with them. And when bad things happen to bad people, weep with them. That's how radical this transformed life is. After all, Christian friends, you're a bad person. And you're undeserving. And yet the best thing of all has happened to you, yes? So that's how God has dealt with you. You know how to deal with others. Jesus takes this up in the the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, 
so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even, do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you must be perfect as your Father, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Of course you can rejoice with those who rejoice if they're your friends, if they're your brother. But your enemies? That's how radical this is. That's how different this is. This is what the life of heaven lived on earth looks like. It's not being conformed, is it? It really is transformation. Moving on to verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. So what's all that about? How does that fit into this overall picture of living for God's glory in a hostile world? Well, churches facing persecution, they need to be united. That was the problem in Philippi. Well, so Paul writes this letter to the Philippians, and, and the big theme he has in it, a, 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 a city so proud of its links to Rome, in which everyone idolized Caesar, which is strength and power and me first. He has to say to the church, you need to have the mind of Christ, not Caesar, the one who truly is Lord. You must be humble. But he says this church is facing a persecution. He says this, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm, and listen, in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in, any, in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Here's a church facing persecution. So Paul says to them, you must stand together, shoulder to shoulder. He could just as well have said, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Because Christian says, we don't always agree, do we? That's the nature. We're all different sizes, shapes, backgrounds, people, personalities. Of course there's, there's going to be points of tension and friction. But we can agree to stand shoulder to shoulder. That in the church there is no them and us. <coughs> Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Don't admire yourself. And when others don't admire you, take offence. And feel sorry for yourself. Feel somehow you deserve better. Don't they know who I am? Live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Go out of your way, says Paul, to associate with people who are not like you. To associate with people who maybe you feel are beneath you. Because what is it that divides churches? It's pride, isn't it? And how does pride speak? Pride is all about me, 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 me first. What about me? I'm a somebody, you're a nobody. Well, there's nothing like giving our pride a, a thoroughly good kicking and beating by spending time with people you think are below you. That's what we need to do with our pride, isn't it? Look for the people you think, oh, I wouldn't, not sure I would. Lowly, I mean, you can, if you're great at sport, then go and associate with someone who's rubbish at sport. If you're clever, go and speak to someone, spend time with someone who's not as clever as you. We can have humility and we have all sorts of different measures, don't we? All of us have something we think, yes, that's me. Well, go and find someone who's not like that and spend time with them and give your pride a good kicking. It's what it needs. Spend time with what you regard as the nobodies, the losers. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Never assume you're right. Never think that your opinion counts double. That it's my way or no way. Now, let's put all that together, yeah? 
Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Put it all together, what have you got? Put it all together in a church, what have you got? You've got a self-forgetting, self-denying, self-sacrificing church. You've got believers serving one another, loving one another, living for one another, united, shoulder to shoulder, in a hostile world. And there's something more that goes on when you have those qualities. Because what does revenge feed off? Revenge feeds off pride. Don't they know who I am? How dare they? So by putting pride to death, we are much more able to bless and not to curse. So moving on, verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. How are we to respond to the vindictive and the, and the hostile? Joseph Candy said, forgive your enemies, but remember their names. Well, we're not to be conformed to this world, are we? So when it comes to payback, Paul says, wrong foot them. Don't do what everyone else does. Let them see the difference the gospel really makes. So in Sri Lanka, in many villages, the well is the key. It's the key to survival. It's the water source. So in some villages, when folk are converted, they're told they can no longer use the well. Because this well is for the Hindus. You're no longer a Hindu, so you can't use the well. Now that's a life and death question, isn't it? The well, the well is fundamental for your survival. It's the water source. They say, this is the Hindu well. If you want a well, go and dig your own. Go and, go and get a Christian well. Well, after the tsunami in 2004, many of the wells were contaminated with seawater. And so Jake and he got teams together to pump out the wells. Did he just pump out the wells belonging to Christians? No, he pumped out everyone's wells, regardless of whether they believed, regardless of whether or not they'd threatened believers. He repaid no one evil for evil. In fact, what he did was he chose to do what was honorable in the sight of all. And you see, by those actions, he adorned the gospel. He wrong-footed people. He didn't give as good as they'd been given. And the attitude of many changed, and people were coming to him, people who had persecuted God's people, and saying, why are you doing this? Why are you pumping out our well, knowing full well the way they treated the Christians? You say, say, why are we doing this? We're doing this to show you the love of Jesus. And on the back of that, people were converted. See what Paul is saying, see how radical this new life is, how transforming it really is. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Give thought, think it through. So Christian friend, you're faced with a situation in Evil's being dished out to you. Well, think it through. How am I going to respond? How am I going to respond in a way that everyone can say, oh, that's wrong-footed as all. You're a Christian? Maybe it'll open a door for the gospel. Look at verse 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Yes, persecution is inevitable, because if they crucified the Prince of Peace, they will certainly crucify his followers. And there are times then when persecution, opposition cannot be avoided. But says Paul, nevertheless, make every effort to live peaceably with all. Be the people who are warm, friendly, kind, generous, hospitable, wise. Do good. Be the best neighbor, the best colleague, the best citizen you can possibly be. So that when conflict, if conflict comes, well, you haven't invited it. In Blandina's words, I am a Christian. We do nothing to be ashamed of. Adorn the gospel. Show by your reaction that, it, that it's real. That here are a transformed people. Here are a people that you cannot explain by anything that's earthly. 
These are the people who know the living God. And nothing will show that more than verses 19 and 20. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Christian friends, vengeance. Injustice creates tension. It creates terrible tensions. Think of the Hillsborough Stadium. Uh, justice uh, for the 96 for, in Liverpool. The tension in that, in that city, in that community, because it wasn't addressed. There was a great injustice. Injustice creates tension because everyone knows there's unfinished business. And no one can rest until justice, not that justice has been done, but justice is seen to be done. And the wrongdoers are called to account, and the wrongdoers are punished. Injustice creates tension, and therein lies the temptation, you see, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. The danger is we can replay those events over and over and over again. And it was wrong, and it was unfair, and it was unjust. And so the grievance grows, and the anger begins to spark and burst into flames, and it burns away, and thoughts become increasingly bitter and twisted, and the cry goes up for vengeance. So how do you break? How do we break that self-destructive cycle? Particularly... Particularly if you're a believer who has witnessed the beating, the imprisonment, the martyrdom of an innocent brother, sister, child of God. How do we, as it were, ease that tension, that cry for justice? Well, says Paul, verse 19, don't take things into your own hands. Beloved, never Never avenge yourselves. And why? Because it's not your place. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It's for God to avenge, not you. It's for him to settle the scores, not you. Justice is his prerogative. That's what God does. He's the one who dispenses judgment, not us. So Paul says, that burden that you're carrying on your back, that burden of the injustice of it all, well, roll that burden off your back because it will destroy you. Roll it onto his back because he's the one who does carry it. Leave vengeance to the one to whom it belongs. Vengeance is mine, it belongs to me, says God. And on judgment day, he will ensure that not that justice is done, but that justice is seen to be done. So Christian friends, leave it with God. No one ever gets away with it. God's character guarantees that he will hold the guilty to account and he will punish those who are responsible. Leave it with him. But that doesn't mean you do nothing then, says Paul, does it? Verse 20. To the contrary, okay, so you're not being, not, you're not being passive. On the, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. I remember hearing of a, a black Christian living in the southern states in the US. He worked at a, in a garage, he was a mechanic. And a car pulled up. And a white man uh, leaned out the window and yelled a whole load of racial abuse and then sped off. This black Christian said, uh, he said, I want my revenge. He said, I want to drive up that road after him and find that his car is broken down. And then I get out, go over and fix his car. <laughs> That's the revenge that Christians are to give. Can you think of anyone you need to get even with? Anyone who's 
Well, pray about it. Plot your revenge. What can you do? How can I bless them? How can I do them good? How can I, through my actions, make them see that my God is the God who shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us? How can I proactively show them the gospel in my response? If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. What does Paul mean by that? For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Is Paul saying that you get your own back another way? You know, you, you really want to, you, but you can't get vengeance. You can't take vengeance into your own hands. But if you're really nice to them, then God will pay them back double. So what he's saying? Well, he's not saying that, is he? Because he's saying leave justice to God. You're not trying to manipulate God's justice by being nice to them. Justice is God's, leave it with him. So he's not saying that. He's saying that by your loving response, what you do is you set your enemy's conscience on fire. Because they're so surprised, they're so wrong-footed by the way you react to them, that the aim is to, is to wake them up to see that the God that we worship is the real God. And this is the God they're on a collision course with. And who knows? By repaying evil with good, and their conscience being set on fire, burning coals on their head, who knows? It may lead them to repentance before it's too late. You see, we're being like our Father in heaven, aren't we? And his kindness, Romans 2, 4, is to lead sinners to repentance. And our kindness is to lead them to repentance. Let me take you back 200 years to two Muslims, Sabat and Abdullah. They were loyal Muslims. They were the best of friends. Abdullah was a, a high-ranking official uh, of the king of uh, Kabul. And one day he found a Bible. He read it. And praise God, he was saved. What to do? Because if he came out as a Christian, that he'd been converted, it would mean death. So he was a secret Christian. He kept his conversion a secret. But of course, ultimately, that's an impossibility, isn't it? Because if you love Christ, you live for Christ, you can't keep it a secret for much longer. So in the end, he left Kabul um, in disguise and went to try and find a place where he could live for Christ and uh, not uh, be in danger. Well, he left Kabul in disguise. He came to the city of Bukhara. It's in modern-day Uzbekistan. And uh, there's a spider on my Bible. Um, the city of Bukhara, and he was walking down the street in disguise, and who should he bump into but his best friend? Sorry, I'm just removing the spider. Sabat. And of course, although he was in disguise, they recognized each other, and his cover was blown. And Sabat, because Abdullah was a high-ranking official, Sabat had heard of his conversion, heard of what had happened. So Abdullah, Abdullah immediately knew he was in danger, so he pleaded with his best friend not to give him away. But his friend was now his enemy. As Sabat later said, I had no pity... And Sabat ordered his servant to uh, lay hold of Abdullah, uh, and he was handed over to the authorities who sentenced him to death. Now, it was to be a public execution, and a great crowd gathered. Here was this Christian who was going to be executed. Great crowd gathered. The king was there. And amongst that crowd was Sabat. Well, the king of Bukhara, he offered Abdullah his life. As the executioner stood over him with a sword, he was told that if he renounced Christ, he would be spared. His life would be given to him. He said, I cannot renounce Christ. So they cut off one of his hands. Again, he was offered his life, offered medical help, if he would renounce Christ. But this time he made no answer. Those who watched said he, he looked up to heaven and eyes 
His, his eyes were streaming with tears. And then he looked at his best friend, Sabat, who was watching all of this. He looked at him, the friend who had betrayed him. And as Sabat later said, it wasn't a look of anger. It was a look of kindness, a look of forgiveness. They then cut off his other hand. But Abdullah, he owned his saviour and lord to the end. And when he bowed his head, the sword fell for the final time. And the people who watched, the people of Bukhara, they asked, they said, what new thing is this? Christian friends, the power of a transformed life, of a life surrendered to Jesus. And Sabat never forgot that look in his friend's eyes. He'd betrayed this friend. He'd showed him no pity. He'd handed him over to the authorities and they had sentenced him to death. He handed him over knowing what would happen to him. But Abdullah looked at him and it was a look of forgiveness. And that look haunted Sabat. Now he later made a profession of faith. And he helped Henry Martin, a great missionary in translating the Bible. But then later on, it seems he was never converted. He walked away from it. But you see, it wasn't a look of anger, of revenge. It was a look of forgiveness. And that look, as it were, heaped burning coals on Sabat's head. Because in that look, he now knew that Abdullah's God was the real God the true God. To see him die like that, to see forgiveness in that man's eyes, he saw, lived out, fleshed out the reality, the power of the gospel of the God who comes and saves and forgives great sinners so that they in their turn can forgive those who sin against them. He knew that God was real and either he must continue in his rebellion or bow the knee. You see the Paul's point to the contrary. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink because people just don't do that in this world. So what you have must be something other. For by so doing you will heap burning coals on his head. And then Paul sums it all up in verse 21. This is his point, really. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In a wicked world where they will seek to crush and destroy and perpetrate evil toward you, you don't give as good as you get. You don't draw your sword. You overcome evil with good. Well, let's just draw all this together. What's the invisible thread that holds these verses together? And the answer is Christ-likeness. All that is said in verses 14 to 21 was made flesh by Jesus himself. And as followers of Jesus, his example binds us at every point. Listen to what Peter says. He says, for what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. All that's said in verses 14 to 21 was lived out by Jesus. And Peter, writing to persecuted believers, said, there's your example. That's how you live. That's how you face persecution. What good is it if you endure it when you get what you deserve? But when you've done good and you suffer for it, God is delighted to see it. And you're walking in the steps of your Lord and Master, his example. But it's more than an example, isn't it? Because what was I, Christian friend? I was his enemy. 
and I rendered evil for good, and I persecuted him, and I was the hard-hearted, Christ-hating rebel. And how did he treat me? He blessed me. He associated with me. He sought my highest good. And he saved my never dying soul at infinite cost to himself. And God's vengeance for my crimes broke upon his head. So that he could say, Father, forgive them. He overcame my evil with gospel conquering good. And that's why Peter goes on and says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And so if we are his people, we are to live the life the transformed life. And nowhere is that life more pulsating with life, more seen to be real, than when faced with the hostility and hatred of the world, we respond in a Christ-like way. Because the world's never seen anything like it. In a world that stands aggressively on its rights and readily takes offense, in a world that loves revenge, he doesn't know what to do with Christians who respond with Christ-likeness. There's, there's people in the city of Bukhara. What, what new thing is this? We've never ever seen this anywhere. And you see, as people witness the beauty of Jesus in the life of his people, as they see there that the gospel is real, your God is real, as they see the, the power of a cross-shaped life, of the way believers suffer, of the way believers face injustice. They have no answer. And they know the gospel's real. And that's why it's so often been the suffering church that have seen many converted. The blessing has come. Because they've seen it's real. The Christians aren't flabby and weak and just like everyone else, but there's still a little bit of Jesus on the side. It's real. That's what Italian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. When they see Christians die and suffer, they know this gospel is real, which puts them on a collision course with God unless they bow the knee. So tomorrow, Christian friend, when you get some stick, or when they sneer, and yet when it is unfair and unreasonable and unjust, wrong foot them all. Challenge everything they've ever believed in by overcoming their evil with good. But Christian friend, remember, you can't do it in your own strength. You can only do it by making Christ your all in all. You can only do it as the Spirit of Jesus Christ in you animates and enables and empowers. And that if His Spirit is burning in you and love for Christ burns in you, then all the slights you bear for Him will seem as so many nothings. And you'll be happy to bear a little bit of reproach for Him who bore everything for me. And if you do waver, well, just remember that little word in verse 19. Did you see it? What does Paul say? He says, Beloved. <coughs> Beloved. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Beloved. See what Paul is saying? You may be hated by others, but you're beloved. You're loved and cherished by God. And whatever they do, they can never, ever take that away. It's that love that makes Christians strong. It's that love which the widow of Graham Staines was able to talk about. It's that love, isn't it? So I'm loved of God that Abdullah can look at his friend with forgiving eyes. So which is better? To stand against Christ or to stand with Christ? To know that you're beloved. 
Would you ever want to swap places with them? Well then, don't feel sorry for yourself. Pity them. Pray for them. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Let's pray. Our Father God, as we read those verses and we put them like a, a template on, on the life of Christ, we see just how beautiful that life is. That all that is said here was said of him. And the more the hostility, the greater the opposition, the more the hatred, the more his loveliness flowed out. And our oh God, that wonderful grace, that great heart that beats for sinners has conquered us. And though we rendered evil for your goodness to us, we thank you that you have saved us and forgiven us. We pray, Father God, for more of your spirit, more of yourself, that we might live in this dark and unbelieving world as Jesus lived. And that, Lord, we might live lives that shed forth the fragrance, the loveliness, the beauty of him, that adorn the gospel, that opens a door for the gospel of grace. That, Lord, by our testimony, others might live. Father, we confess we have very little persecution in this country, if at all. And we do pray this morning, Lord, for your suffering people in many countries in this world. Lord, we pray that you would bring the comfort of the Scriptures and, best of all, the comfort of your presence. And that, Lord, if there is a brother or sister who today will seal their testimony with their blood, we pray that they might know that they are greatly loved. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.